Hi, I'm Jamie Prevaletti, the author of Blood Run, and you are watching Author's Voice. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors around the world. I'm Libby Hellman, your host for Solved, and I want to wish everyone a very happy new year, such that it is only four days old, but we'll get there. Um, we're doing something new today, and I hope that it will work technically and that you will all enjoy it. We are on Facebook Live for the first time, and if it works out, we will do this every time we have a broadcast, which I hope will be, and I hope you'll be able to tune in, and I know that the East Coast is pretty much snowed in anyway, so I hope that you all are watching or will watch at some point because I have a terrific guest today. It's, uh, she is Jamie Frevoletti, who many of you probably already know. She's a terrific thriller author. She just kind of she appeared on the scene. She exploded on the scene. What is it, how many years ago now? 2009. 2009, so it's not quite 10 years yet, with uh, your first Emma Caldridge book, which uh, became a bestseller almost overnight. And um, you won the thriller, the debut thriller award, right? Yes. And probably a whole bunch of others that I'm not thinking about now. Um, <laughs> but it was a great book. And uh, then she. Um, got a contract to write for the Robert Ludlum estate, and she wrote two thrillers for them, which we, I hope we'll get a couple of minutes to chat about. Um, her latest book is another, Emma Caldridge, which she is returning to for the first time in a few years. Um, it's published by Calexia, which is an, an, an imprint of Ingram. It's $16, and if you are watching on um, the Author's Voice Network, you know how to order the book. You just kind of push the order button uh, below the screen that you're looking at. And if you're on, watching on Facebook Live and you'd like to order the book, which of course we would love to do, um, all you have to do is look for the link in the comments section of, on Facebook and you'll be able to order it. Okay. I think I'm done with my housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this book was set in Africa, okay, which is different. I know one, your first book was, was set in South America, and yes. I don't remember where the other two were set, but why Africa? You know, for this book, Emma Caldridge is, is a character, kind of a female MacGyver. So she travels the world looking for plants that have an application in science or medicine. And it enables so she does that for she does that by that's, herself. That's uh, right. She does that for for herself. She's a biochemist. Right. And I put her in very dangerous places, and that's why she started in Colombia during when the paramilitary wars were going. You know, FARC was there. Um, they have since signed, I think, a peace mm -hmm. agreement. And I always put her in an unusual place. And Africa came about because I was reading about some of the insur small insurgencies that are kind of pocketing, dotting all over Africa. And I was looking into the Dakar rally. I don't know if you remember the race, the Dakar rally? Well, I read about it. Yeah. So, and that was one of my questions. What in heaven's name is <laughs> it's the Dakar? Dakar rally? Okay. So, Let, well, yeah. Anyway, we'll get to that. But so that's how ahead. it happened. OK. Um, you didn't go there. I did not. Well, but not, you did. Well, most of the places I write about with Emma Caldridge, you wouldn't be not advised to go. Although I did go to Colombia, I will okay. say I did that much. But most of the pl she was in Somalia once. No, I did not yeah. go to Somalia yeah. to write the story. But your your descriptions of the terrain and this and yes. you know the scenes, uh, the locations, just were so. I mean, they really spoke to me. You really got it down. Yeah, I do you? a lot of research. Yeah. So obviously, if you can't get to Somalia, um, and in this case, it was the she's on the border between Senegal, Mali, and Mauritania, and in through the Sahara Desert. Okay. So if if you can't actually get there, it's physically, in the western part, mm -hmm. right? Yes, it is. Okay. And so 
I'll do a lot of re intense, intense research. I'll talk to people who live there. Um, I also look on Google Earth. I just anything I can find, anyone I can speak to photographs. about these photographs, yeah. everything the yeah. the plant life, obviously because she's looking for plant life, uh, and usually that you get a real picture of the area. Sometimes I have been to some of the areas like Columbia, and I've been there personally to to do some research. The thing is about going to the area, you have to be a little careful as an author because you still are a tourist in the area. So if you don't go with some really in-depth knowledge or you meet a local, mm -hmm. you're still getting kind of the, the surface aspect of and it. So, so people who already know the area say, oh, well, that's just, she's just at the first level. Right. right. So right. you have to kind of be careful. So you have to do your research whether right. you want to or not. Right? Exactly. So. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about Emma and her job. Um, she is a biochemist, but she has kind of reacher-like skills. Um, yes. Why did you, how did that come about? How did you discover her? The Emmett Caldridge character came out of an actual event. Really? Yes. So what <laughs> happened was, so I'm a runner. My husband's a huge runner. He's an ultramarathon runner. So Emma Caldridge is an ultramarathon runner. I was at a race. I usually handled, uh, I was a handler for my husband who was an, who's an ultramarathon. Ultramarathons, for those who don't understand or haven't heard of them, are 35 miles and above. My husband was running a 100-mile race. Mm -hmm. So you have to do 100 miles in 24 hours. I was there. There was, an, there was a freak snowstorm started to be 70 degrees. People flew in from all over the world for this into Golden, Colorado. And it was about 70 degrees in the afternoon when we started. And they ran a two-mile loop out, or a few-mile loop out into a, a field, a, a forest preserve, and then back. And I was with the group handling people. So as they came around, we'd check them off. Because in 24 hours, a lot of things can happen to people. If you're running 24 hours straight, it's, a, it's an extreme sport. So it started at 70 degrees. By 10 at night, it dropped, and there was a massive snowstorm. Oh, my. And these poor runners were not dressed for this. One man got hypothermia, dropped on the path, didn't come back. We didn't check him off. And they, I, was, I was assigned to go get him. So I went and got him. We put him in, a, in an ambulance, and I, I rode with him. In the, he had hypothermia. He didn't know his name. He was kind of out of it completely. He was from England. And we got him into the, the hospital, into the ER, and I was sitting there, and I'd been writing a book that I immediately put aside, a book about uh, kind of a Madoff Ponzi scheme book. I put it aside because I thought, you know, this is, a, this is a story. You're in an unfamiliar area. You are, he had hypothermia, so he was completely disoriented. He couldn't tell up from down, and you can't get out. What do you do? And that started my first book, Running from the Devil. She's downed in the Colombian jungle. She can't see the sunrise or set and she has to track <laughs> behind paramilitaries. Mm. So this came out of an actual event in my life. Wow. I didn't know yes. that. Yeah. Um, I forgot to tell the audience that you can write in questions on Facebook Live. You already know how to do that. And if you're watching on the AuthorsNet website, you can also write in questions. Let us know your name and where you're from. And well, we've already got one, so I oh, may okay. as well go with that. Sure. Um, this is from Beth, and she's watching through authorsvoice.net. How much medical knowledge did you have to acquire to make Emma's situation realistic? Thanks, Beth. Yes, yeah, so I was an attorney before I became an author, and I, the kind of law I did was food, drug, and medical device <laughs> law. So the reason that um, I wrote the petition to FDA for oatmeal to be you can say that oatmeal lowers your cholesterol. So right. I was in a law firm that wrote that petition to FDA. So I spent a lot of time with medical devices, all kinds of experts in the medical field. So that's where Emma gets a lot of her knowledge. I read a lot of the Federal Register. I know it sounds, mm -hmm. I know I'm sounding very boring, right? <laughs> no, I don't no. mean to sound so boring. I love the GAO, the Government <laughs> Accountability Offices. I like, I'm on, oh, I cheering. follow them on Twitter. Right. <laughs> I'm a total nerd. But that's where I get the no, idea. I, I follow the congressional record, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, so that's, how I, that's how I do it. OK. Um, in your book, you have, a rela you have relationships between Emma and a company called Darkview, which, sounds, which, which has a perfect name, yes. considering where we are in life, um, and Banner and Sumner, plus 
U.S. DOD. Can you kind of explain the different forces that Emma needs to deal with in a, in, in a given situation and how that happened in Blood Run? In Blood Run, the real issue in most of my books, I, I love the idea of an average person in unusual circumstances. Now, she's a little bit above average because she's able to run and she has these um, skills, kind of MacGyver-like skills. She always gets herself out of trouble, but not usually by always picking up a gun. Mm -hmm. she, she has to find another way to do it. And what I liked about, what I needed to have is a group that could help her at times, but I wanted her to remain the main protagonist. Most of America has, as our military, we have contract, contract military people all over the world. And that would be something like, a, a, one example would be Blackwater, right? So these are contract military mm -hmm. groups. And that's what Darkview is, and it kind of a, a good a okay. side of it, a even good though, side of it. Though, even though they're called, well, they're Dark not. Dark View, that's yeah. the name. Well, they're not Black View, so. Right. I guess they're not okay. Blackwater, but uh, so I wanted to have a group that would come and help her at times, and because in many times, America can't simply send their military in. We're only consultants in various countries. And I think we learned that with the recent Niger mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. We're consulting, we're not always there. So this Dark View is that kind of group, and then Sumner is part of that. He, he has his own job, and based again on a real job that I read about, uh, based in Key West. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, and Banner is also part of it? Banner's part of Darkview. He's the mm -hmm. head of Darkview, and he goes in and he runs these, these uh, military crews throughout the world. Okay. So when there is a problem and you can't send in the army, you send in uh, a Someone contract like security company. Right, right. And that's now Banner. what's Emma, Emma's relationship with them? Well, when the first book, Running from the Devil, she was down in the Colombian jungle, and they sent Darkview in to try and extract her and some of the hostages that were taken Who with her. Uh, the United States. Oh, oh So okay. Banner takes jobs as a... A government contractor. Government contractor, correct. Okay. So, to, and now then there's also Rand. Now, who's Rand? Okay, so in, we're talking about Blood Run now. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I, so Emma Coldridge is the main character. So there's usually a group, Dark View, that comes around. Uh, Banner is the head of that, another uh, character called Strohmeyer. And then Sumner is a man that she sees in and out. He does work for Dark View as well. In this latest book, she's in the South, in Africa. And what I wanted to do was show some of the political issues involving Africa. And it started, as I mentioned, from the Dakar rally. So the Dakar rally used to go from Paris all the way through Mauritania to Dakar. It, does, it no longer does it because in one year there were deaths due to an insurgency. And now they often do the Dakar rally is actually based in South America. But I wanted her to track that and run through the desert, through the Sahara Desert at the end. So she starts out, she's doing a humanitarian mission in, mm -hmm. in Africa. She's bringing vaccines to villages in Africa. She teams up with this pharmaceutical company, and Rand is the head of the pharmaceutical okay. company. Okay. And it goes wrong bad. Right. It goes south pretty quickly because right. they find out that an actual virus, the smallpox virus, is, has been found again and might be in one of the vials. And that is also based on something true. So in 2012, believe it or not, the National Institute of Health, uh, Beth is probably sitting there thinking, well, she knows her medicine <laughs> now. Man, she's talking the National Institute of Health. But in 2012, the National Institute of Health moved their offices and left a bunch of stuff in a closet. Yeah, you <laughs> so said they, that in they the book. Found, yeah, they found a vials in this closet. They opened the vials. They were from 1954. They went, sent them to the CDC to be tested. They were closing up the building, moving all the furniture. They found this box, old, dusty old box of vials. Turns out there was live smallpox virus in some of these vials, along with some other biochemical weaponry viruses. Mm. CDC took care of it. It was listed as a, an inventory control issue, <laughs> which is a very you know, bland way of saying, wow, we lost okay. our vials. And that's what gave me the idea for Blood Run. Yeah, um, <laughs> the, the um, pace of Blood Run was unbelievable. Um, there was never a dull moment. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean. It's what you want with a thriller, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and yeah. I was going to say, how long did it take you to get to the point where you understand pacing and you know from your own uh, chapters where you need to have something happen and where you can kind of lay back for a little while and let the characters lead? I think my... When I started writing for Ludlum, my first book for Ludlum, The Janus Reprisal, I had an idea that I wanted to write a book. I'd been writing thrillers, and I thought pacing, was really, pacing is very important in thrillers, as you know. 
If you don't have pacing, you got nothing in a thriller. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write a book that was kind of like Speed. You know the movie Speed, where you can't drop sure. below 55? Sure. Everyone said you have to have these ups and downs, and I yeah. wanted to write a no, first wanted... few chapters that went straight through. Of course, you're a runner. Like, you just I'm a runner. <laughs> yeah, like what would that be like? So I did that in the Janus Reprisal, the first five or six chapters. And since then, I've been kind of challenged myself. I don't do it all the time because you do need those mm -hmm. valleys. Mm -hmm. Without the valleys, you don't really have a story. You can't go at 100 miles an hour all the time. But that's kind of where I started to learn pacing. I started to mm -hmm. think about how far can I make can I keep the momentum going? And part of doing that is you have to actually, I know it sounds weird, but you have to slow down your description. Because if I said, well, and then the bomb dropped in her head, mm -hmm. that's the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to explain how the bomb left the, right. you know what I mean? You have to go through all the steps to slow it right. down while you're still talking about something that's happening very fast. I actually have a name for it, and you it do. isn't my name. Okay. I borrowed it from someone, literary slow motion. Oh, wow, who said that? Jay, I can't think. Oh, God. A thriller writer? Yes. Ah. Bon, uh, Boninsenga. Yes. Bonin, Jay Boninsenga. Boninsenga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice his man. term. Yeah. 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 So, so for all of Literary all slow of motion. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Um, so you have the State Department getting involved. Once, once they realize that they may have some live smallpox vaccine, you have the State Department getting involved. You have Darkview getting involved. You have DOD keeping its eye out. Um, how realistic would that be in a real, in, do you think? It's pretty realistic. Yeah. I don't think, if, if we found live smallpox virus, which we have, um, obviously, it's not, it's a, it's a terrible thing because it's supposedly eradicated. And a lot of us, people, people haven't been vaccinated for smallpox in a very long time. We do have vaccine stores. But if they found it, initially you'd have to go through diplomatic procedures to get into these countries. You can't mm -hmm. just send someone into a country that's a foreign country. So a lot of what I do in, involves, like, what would actually happen? How would we do that? Because, you know. You know what? That begs the question of how are they doing it now, given the state of the, the state, state of things. Well, you have, to, you have to get diplomats out there. You have to use, you yeah. have to have passports. People with a passport in the country, you have to, you know, the, the heads of the NIH has to talk to the head of that, uh, in, in Africa and say, hey, you've got some missing vaccines, we've got to find them, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I try to run that through the stories, but not get you too caught up and it's not mm -hmm. dry. Right. Otherwise, you know, that could kill a story if you go on every little minutia right. of what goes on. So there are good mercenaries and not so good mercenaries. And yeah. Darkview uh, obviously has good mercenaries. Yes. But there are a whole bunch of people bad in guys. the book. Bad guys. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about them and who they work for and where they came from. There's a lot of, most of the bad guys in my book are based on real insurgents. Uh, there's a lot of ins small insurgencies throughout Africa, this part of Africa. And um, they're in Mali, and they're always kind of operating under the wire. And they're kind of under control at times, and then they will flare up. And so you get a lot of that in the book, where she's running through, she's on the border, she's trying to get across the border, and then she's in Mauritania, and then she's in the Sahara. Mm -hmm. And trying to march through the Sahara is kind of an interesting, it's an interesting and difficult run. And there are runs that run through the desert here. It's mm -hmm. called um, Western States. And that's a run through our desert here. And, and you know, you're, it gets so hot that your, your shoes will melt to the pavement in that race right. in the great western states and she's now in in the sahara, in the sahara it's the same, is, same yeah, issue yeah did she have enough water I, at one point i think she didn't have a whole lot yeah of water. Not, they had some water yeah you're not gonna last too long without water yeah although there is water in, in the in the desert you can find it yeah. yeah did she know and she knew where to get it because she had a gps or something like that or Okay. She had water with her, yeah. and then okay. she met with a group that had water. Okay. So there are other characters that pop up during the course of the book, and, and this must have been one of the places where you, you let the characters go. I, my favorite character was Vic. Everyone loves Vic. <laughs> I'm like, every time I get interviewed for this book now, someone brings up Vic. Yeah. i got to bring Vic back, clearly. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah you do. Yeah. Tell us about Vic. Part of the story is involves uh, refugee camps, and I wanted to show that when, when things go awry in a country, everyone gets taken up. You know, it's the government. You're all into the surge. They're all running for the borders, and Vic is in a traveling theater troupe, 
<laughs> he's a traveling theater guy. I, and I mean, he's just, just everybody like, loves Vic, I know. And, and he, he bumps into Emma and he tells her he's a pretty practical guy. Yeah. And she's, you know, my Emma Caldridge character is a really upstanding woman. She always wants to do the right thing. She tries really hard. And it's fascinating because Vic comes to her and, and she says, you know, no, we're not going to let this happen. We are going to stop that. And Vic mm -hmm. is the one who says, yeah, you know, you got to think about this from another angle. And he's kind of a really interesting character. He's, he's marching with an older woman, the older African woman, Biba. Right. Right. And Biba's, Biba's an interesting character, too. She's walking around yeah. with her grand niece, her grandson's AK-47 that she has. So she's, a, she, and she's an African woman. And it, you know, these, this is the group. You know, Emma's in this surge of, of humanity that's trying to get to the border ahead of the insurgency. Right. And I wanted to show that you know, from all walks of life you get caught up in this, in the current migrant situation. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, small pockets. It's a complete surge. And then the issue comes when you hit the border of another country, are they going to let you over the border? And that's not necessarily given. Mm -hmm. So in the book, it's not necessarily a given Right, either. they have big trouble. Big trouble getting yeah. across the border. Yeah. You can't just walk into another country. I know it happens, but it's very difficult to do. Yeah. There's one line, it's my favorite line in the book, and, uh, and I have to read it to you. Um, and I'm sh not sure who it was said about. It might have been about Vic, but um, you're just a drug jockey using a rusting bucket of nails held together with duct tape. Yeah. I just thought that was a great That's line. That's Vanderlocks. She has, she has a South African pilot that she sometimes yes. sees, yes. Vanderlock, okay. Wilson Vanderlock. And he's okay. always, he, and he can't afford a really new, a new plane, but he can fly anything that right. flies. And this is the pharmaceutical company CEO. He's kind of a ritzy, rich guy from America. And he's trying to get Vanderlock to do something. And Vanderlock says no. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll buy you a new, I'll buy you a new thing. And Vanderlock still says no. And then it gets angry. And that's right. what he says. Right, right. Yeah. That's a great line. Yeah. Um, sandstorm. There's a big sandstorm, of yeah. course. Uh -huh. um, how does this, do you, I'm sure you studied the physics of a sandstorm yes. and how it starts. How do, what is a sandstorm? How does it start? It's, it's a, it starts with wind and with a lot of loose sand. Uh, in America, the version would have been the Dust Bowl. So, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Interestingly enough, I started reading about the Dust Bowl and how big, you know, yeah. big, almost literally, if you see the pictures, uh, was it Burns who did that, that whole, um, mm -hmm. oh, it was a wonderful mm -hmm. series, a mm -hmm. miniseries. Everyone sees, maybe it's on Netflix, about the Dust Bowl. Right. And you would see this cloud, this black cloud coming behind you. So I started looking into the Sahara, the big sandstorms. And I read about the Siwa Oasis. So this Calabresis in some BC had, was driven into the, supposedly driven into the Sahara. And thousands of soldiers were buried by a sandstorm. And that just fascinated me. Now that was supposed to be a myth, but the Bedouins say that actually happened. And they have now found something in the Sahara that might be some artifacts really? from this massive 50,000 army men buried how long sand. would this storm last? Just they can last hours. They can last days. Wow. And I thought it was fascinating. So I had to put something about that yeah, in the yeah, book. Yeah. And she's in the Sahara Desert. So there's a lot of interesting things about the Sahara. I also read about how the Bedouins actually march through. Because there are some people cross the Sahara every day without cars or whatever. High and tech stuff. Any yeah, tech and stuff. And yeah. they're able to do it. Now, you yeah. wouldn't do that on your own. But right. I read about how the Bedouins do it, what their, their head markings are on the trails what cool. they recommend. It's very, very cool. If I, if I can get out there and do that, I will. Right now, the insurgencies are in pockets, and it's too risky to do. But. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, without any spoilers, you have uh, a lot of things revolve around an airbag in a car. Yeah. And I'm wondering, did you actually examine one for yeah. your research? Yeah. No? OK. How do you get the airbag out of the They're car? They're not hard to get out of the car. Oh, you did that? Yes. Um, you know, actually, there's, it's not hard to get most of your stuff out of the car. I did okay. a case but when I was a lawyer, before I started writing. I did a case involving a large manufacturer in Detroit of cars. Which was, that's how much I'll say about that. But I learned <laughs> that I represented a part maker that put these parts into a car. And you know how you have these little air vents? This particular car, if you punch a little on the side, you could pop those. Those are plastic pieces that yeah. are molded for the dashboard. Yeah. So you just kind of pop it. You can. You know, we spend a lot of time as a so you know, you're bored, you're on you're on 
location doing depositions all day long, so we're like popping out the vents <laughs> on our cars. Hey, look, isn't this cool? People are like, please put you know my vent back in the car. I'm like, oh, okay. But uh, that's when I realized that a lot of these pieces do come out for to be serviced or whatever. So if you mm -hmm. go behind your steering wheel, certain cases, there's just a little tabs. There are two tabs, and if you have the right equipment, you press those tabs, and that airbag will module will come out. And it is attached by electricity to your... So it's all folded up? No, it's actually in a... It's, it's, no. it's a piece of metal. It's oh, in a okay. plastic thing. And when it explodes, that's, it, it explodes outward. Okay. But they okay. have... It's, it's made in a certain way. I'm all trying right. not to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying not to be a spoiler here. But yeah. Okay. So that's how it works. Okay. Uh, we Don't pull out your own airbags, please, because, <laughs> because there is an electrical surge and current, and it's not... You've got to go to a, a dealership to do that. Just got to do that. Lawyer and right. me. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> you you're good. Do, you know. oh, you, you're not doing any practicing not anymore. anymore. No. Okay. Too many books to write. Okay. Um, I think maybe we have a couple minutes left, so let's talk a, a little bit about um, the Janus reprisal and your work for Ludlum and Ludlum. Those, those two books. Okay, so I did two for Ludlum yeah. for the Covert One series, the Janus reprisal and the Geneva strategy. Right. Some lovely woman this morning gave me a... Just raved about the Geneva strategy on my Facebook page. Thank you. Um, and I loved it. It was a great experience. Right now, I think they're, um, I don't know if they're on hold while they're waiting for a television show or really? not. Yeah, I'm not would sure. Would it be what. a Ludlum television show or a covert? It would be covert one series using okay. those characters, but I'm not sure where things yeah. stand. Um, yeah. I enjoyed doing that. I did a nonfiction, Anatomy of Innocence, that just got picked by Lit Hub. It's one of the top true crime right. novels. Right. I had Laura on. Yeah, uh, she's wonderful, isn't ago. she? Yeah. So yeah. we got picked for one of the top true crime short anthologies, which I thought was great. That's called Anatomy of Innocence. And then I just was telling you, I just handed in a Sherlock Holmes a short story using Sherlock Holmes for an anthology that I was, great. I was asked to do. So yeah. that was, oh, I got almost, I got almost, that's the first time ever. I never get writer's block. Yeah. But when... When I sat down to write Sherlock Holmes, I was like, okay, now I'm stuck. Yeah. For, for a couple of days, I, I was like, wow, I don't, I don't did think Did you I get one? This. Did you, was the um, solution to the crime one of those little obscure things that only Sherlock wanna, Holmes would know? I didn't want to go there because, I, I don't know, I just didn't, I didn't want to go there. I, I put him in Chicago. It's a fun story. Really? Yeah, I put okay. him in Chicago and he hits a bunch of landmarks here in Chicago. <laughs> but most people across the country will know these landmarks too because they're kind of iconic because mm -hmm. we have a lot of those in mm -hmm. Chicago so mm -hmm. it's, it's I can't again I can't because of a spoiler but I'm really excited I did get it done everybody it, it took a pound of flash and I sweat through every word <laughs> but it's done okay yeah. and, <laughs> and so you did mention before we started but maybe um, our listeners and viewers would like to know um, what you're working on now I am working on two books. One is called The Italian Curse. It's a runner in you. You've got to yeah, just be ahead of everyone, right? One is called The Italian Curse, and it's based in Rome. And it's about a, a young woman who learns something about her family. It's a mystery. And the other one is set in the Gold Rush era. Another strong woman who strikes out for the Gold Rush. Yeah, great. And uh, Working the next Emma Caldridge novel is almost I'm at, I'm at quite a few thousand words on that, so that one will probably come out next year. Really? Mm -hmm. So so there that's three books you're working on. That's three, on. but the other two I kind of cheated, because I when I when I got the Ludlum contract I was writing on these other novels and I had okay. to put them aside okay. for Ludlum, so I picked them back up. So it's All a little right. bit of a cheat. Okay, I feel yeah. better. <laughs> it's not like I'm doing three a year. Okay. <laughs> um, again, everyone, I hope that you will want to order. Blood Run. It was a terrific read. I can't um, talk about it more. I mean, I would love to talk about it more, but we're running out of time to do that. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you should see a link in the comments section. And if you're watching on authorsvoice.net, you know what to do. It's below the screen that you're watching the show on. And we want to thank Jamie and Calexia for, for uh, being here today. Thank, thank you. you. It was a great, great to see you. And I want to tell you a little bit about some upcoming shows on Author's Voice, Connecting Authors to the World. Um, Lit with Love, which is our romance show, is January 10th at 2 p.m. 
with Kristen Higgins' new title, Now That You Mention It. We have another edition of Solved next week at January 10th, so we're doing a double header on that day at 3.30 p.m. with Sujata Massey, who's coming in to talk about her latest um, book, which is the first in a new series set in India in Bombay in the 1920s. Nice. It's called The Widows of Malabar Hill. Uh, Berta's Books will be here on January 18th at 2 p.m. with Elizabeth Berg and her latest book, The Story of Arthur True Love. And Lit With Love will be back again January 24th at 5.30 p.m. with Sonali Dev's newest, A Distant Heart. All the details and ways to order, uh, any questions that you have are on authorsvoice.net. And if you happen to be watching this on YouTube after the fact, you can still order signed books just by going to the website and you should find the um, author um, order, the order button is what I'm going to say. Uh, Jamie's going to be here for a little while to sign all of these wonderful books that we have of hers. So I hope you will definitely take her up on getting a signed copy of Blood, Blood Run. Thanks so much for being with us on Solved. I'll be back again very soon.